How many of you have never been to the Woodpole Film Festival before? And you're here because of this incredible panel, right? Thank you for that. So the Woodpole Film Festival takes place each summer from the last Saturday of July through the first Saturday of August. It's always an eight-day event. This year we're screening 116 films selected from more than 1,000 films we received from around the world. And I hope that this week you will take advantage of the opportunity that you have to see amazing films by amazing filmmakers, many of whom have come here. And as you all know, the pandemic changed everything. Traditionally, all of our screenings had been only in person, but in 2020, uh, we were for forced to confront the fact that we wouldn't be able to have our traditional Woods Hole Film Festival as we had known it before the pandemic. So we also created a virtual option. So this week, if you don't have a chance to see everything in person, some of the film, most of the films are available virtually as well. And um, please take an opportunity to be part of this incredible community that we create each year over these eight days. The filmmakers come here in large part because it's an opportunity for them to see their films on a screen with an audience and get a chance to meet each other and to share experiences and opportunities. And we hope that pro by providing this opportunity for this community that we create, we will inspire creativity and connectivity and that we'll all be back here in the future having different but similar conversations. One of the things about the Woods Hole Film Festival that we do that's different from a lot of festivals, we have a film and science initiative and you may have gotten a flyer on the way in and that film and science initiative is something we started to develop about 10 years ago, um, in part because we are located in Woods Hole, which is a scientific community. And we know that the stories that um, make their way to, sc to the screen, many of them are directly related to the work that happens both here at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, the Marine Biological Laboratory, NOAA Fisheries, and we know the importance of telling these stories to advance the understanding of science and storytelling. And so with our film and science initiative, one of the things we do is show films. Another thing that we do is create films. And this year we've had the opportunity to screen some of the films that we've created at the Museum of Science in Boston. And you'll see, uh, we'll have another opportunity to see Bruce and Alvin, which is a film that we premiered last year about Bruce Strickrott and the Alvin Submersible on August 20th, right here in this auditorium. It will sell out, so get your ticket in advance. It is free, but you need to register through the HUI website. Before we get started, I want to thank my colleagues at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution with, with whom we work closely every year to make our science-based screenings so successful. And this panel discussion and the science-based screenings that we're showing during the festival have been supported by a relationship that we also have with the Yaki Foundation. And um, this panel is being um, presented under the auspices of a program called Dispatches from an Ocean Planet. And I would just like to thank Sam Harp and Erica and Donna and everybody who worked at Allison, <clears throat> everyone who really worked so hard to make this happen. It is no small feat. So before we get started, I would just suggest that if you haven't been here before, the exits are on either side. This is a working science building. So if you do need to leave, please don't walk around the building. They have creatures that might bite you. Um, and then if you need to go downstairs, if you need to the, use the restroom, please go downstairs through the lobby. Um, <clears throat> so we're gonna get started with, I, with something that I know will be an amazing opportunity to have a discussion among people who do similar work, who have all never really actually met each other before today, but who are along the same trajectory. So I'm just gonna do a brief introduction of everyone. We're gonna have a conversation among ourselves and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. Before we get started, are there any people here who have been to Antarctica? Okay. Are there any people here who have been to the Arctic or Greenland? So you guys will net definitely be welcome participants in the conversation. <clears throat> so today, to my immediate left, is Holly Morris. 
Holly is the filmmaker of a film called Exposure, which is screening later today in this auditorium. And um, Holly has told and championed uh, stories that are pro-women on the global stage for over two decades. She's an internationally known filmmaker, author, and presenter. And she's written and directed several documentaries that explore the lives of unlikely icons. She's a longtime host of several television documentary series, including the PBS series Globe Trekker. So thank you, Holly. Um, to Holly's immediate left is Dr. Sarah Doss. Dr. Doss is a polar scientist, educator, and explorer. She's participated in over 20 scientific expeditions to the Arctic and Antarctic over the past 25 years. Wow, that's incredible. And she's a scientist um, here at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, which as many of you know is um, the largest independent oceanographic institution in the United States. Welcome, Dr. Doss. Um, to her immediate left is Will Seeger. Will is um, an internationally renowned polar explorer, best known, best known for his legendary expeditions. Um, he's traveled tens of thousands of miles by kayak and dog sled over 50 years, leading teams on some of the most significant polar expeditions in history. He's featured in the documentary After Antarctica, which we screened here last night, which is available virtually if you haven't had a chance to see it. And um, that film was a dramatic attempt to bring awareness to the changing continent of, of Antarctica. And we're, we'll talk about that film, which was made by Natasha Van Zandt. Natasha is our 2022 filmmaker in residence this year at the Woods Hole Film Festival. Um, and she has worked closely with Will and her producer, Sebastian Zeck, to make this film and to bring it here to Woods Hole. Tasha is also working on an, a second film that will be related to the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution that we hope to see in the coming years. She's an award-winning director, cinematographer, photographer, and Emmy-nominated Emmy, oh, Emmy, Emmy producer who's documented stories across all seven continents. And this was her debut uh, documentary feature-length film. So thank you so much, everyone, for being here. For me, the exciting thing about this panel is this is a really a unique opportunity to bring together people whose voices matter so much and whose films matter so much. And so we're going to get started. I'm just going to ask each one of you down the line, talk a little bit about uh, what you do and how you came to do it. So let's talk about your film exposure, Holly. Okay. So um, good to be here. Thank you for that introduction on everyone's behalf. Um, so uh, the film Exposure uh, is a feature-length documentary film playing at 6.15 in this very room tonight. If anyone would like to come, and it's about um, a group of women from the Arab world in the West who teamed up to ski, attempt to ski to the North Pole. Um, so it is uh, sort of part adventure, part uh, uh, feminist manifesta, part um, and part environmental film, I think. And so it is an intersectional project. It's also, I think, very entertaining. Um, and uh, so uh, that's I, I'm, oh, throughout my career, I've, I've I've often done projects in the natural world uh, featuring women who are um, well. The, let's. The, Put it this way. My last feature was called The Babushkas of Chernobyl. So it was about a group of old women who lived inside the Chernobyl exclusion zone and refused to be evacuated after the accident in 86. So um, sort of in the crucible of environmental uh, catastrophe, um, sort of stories of affirmation. Uh, I'm not a scientist, but there is a, a, scientist, a science theme that runs lightly through the film. Thanks everyone for coming. It's great to see so much interest. Um, yeah, so I'm Sarah, I'm a scientist here at Woods Hole Oceanographic. I've been at Woods Hole for um, almost 20 years now. Um, I've been working in uh, polar science, climate science, earth science for my entire career. Um, really got started as many scientists do, um, just out of a sense of curiosity about the world, how things work, how things are connected. And um, that's been enough to, to carry me through my career. 
When I started working in polar science, I uh, first traveled to Antarctica in 1995. And the science questions there were, of course, fascinating and compelling. We were drilling holes through the ice sheet um, to understand what was happening underneath and why the glaciers were moving the way they were. But the pressing sort of climate crisis that we're living under now was really just beginning. It wasn't you know, even a topic of conversation when I was a college student or even beginning in graduate school. But it's become such a pressing concern and to see what's been happening in the polar regions and the demise of the polar ice sheets over the course of my career has um, been really striking and certainly kept me up at night. Um, because of their urgency, you know, I'm also really thrilled to be here with um, the storytellers, filmmakers, adventurers, um, because of course the, it goes well beyond the science. The polls touch on all of our lives. The urgency is there and um, I really hope we can all move together to, to improve the situation. Thanks. I'm, I'm Will Seeger, and the uh, last 60 years I've been uh, traveling, exploring the, the uh, north, uh, both polar regions. Um, my profession is actually an educator. And, um, and I've seen the big changes. Uh, I've studied climate all my life. I taught global warming in my classrooms actually in the 60s. So it wasn't a bandwagon I jumped on. It was something that I was always aware of, but I actually saw uh, the major changes unfold on the ice, I was on the ice when it started to melt. Uh, first seen it in the in the 90s on the Arctic Ocean, and then in 02 the Larsen ice shelf, yeah, Larsen B ice shelf broke up, and followed by many other catastrophes that followed that. But uh, being an eyewitness, I was able to bring this story to the public, and it, science is often very confusing uh, to the average person. But uh, if you bring it on a, on a story, especially a personal story that has lots of adventure, but uh, bringing them in, in vicariously into the polar environment to see what it's like. And, uh, and it's a great uh, storytelling, great way of getting, uh, uh, educating people. And uh, I, I formed a nonprofit 20 years ago called Climate Generation in Minnesota. We have uh, about 20 on staff now, mostly educators. And uh, we were instrumental in most of our policies and uh, wind energy and so forth in the state. And so it was very powerful. I was here with Natasha and Sebastian with the movie uh, After Antarctica. And Antar After Antarctica is an incredible story that they did, but it was a crossing of 80, 1989, 90, uh, 3,700 miles, uh, the longest possible route across Antarctica. Uh, we had six people from six of the major countries that participated in Antarctica. And, uh, but it was much more than a, a, a great adventure. Uh, in 1990, the Antarctic Treaty was up for review. Uh, and then in 1986, four years before that, uh, the uh, 27 treaty nations at that time had drew up a formal document to uh, explore for minerals, which was basically the beginning of the end of that environment. And that was done actually behind closed doors at that time. And uh, so we decided to form this Crossing Antarctica, the Trans-Antarctica Expedition to draw world attention to the need to preserve Antarctica. And it was the power of the images. This is pre-internet, but uh, we reached, we had almost 3 billion media impressions at that time. But uh, after the expedition, we toured the world, we met with world leaders, and we were able to get all 27 treaties, nations to reverse their vote and to set Antarctica aside, at least for the next 50 uh, years or so. So uh, it's a good statement of the power of you know, science, uh, photography, adventure, and then bringing that in real time into the public realm. Um, and I'm Tasha Van Zant, the director of After Antarctica. And um, as Will said, you know, After Antarctica follows that incredible journey from 1989 to 1990 of the Trans-Antarctica Expedition. And my focus with that film was really showing Will's life story as an eyewitness across both poles. And I'm very drawn to documentary storytelling um, of firsthand accounts of the changes happening to our environment. And um, I should point out that Cassie Kasich, Kathy Kasich, the filmmaker of The Lake at the Bottom of the World, really intended to be here, but she got stuck in Greenland. Um, but if you haven't had a chance to see her film, I highly recommend it. And that film also included, that expedition included people from Hui. So um, 
one of the questions I have for the filmmakers is, you know, when you're making a film about an issue like climate change or an expedition, how do you know where the story is? How do you shape the story? And when you're creating the film, what role does science play in that film? Well, um, I think in, in, in the kinds of, uh, at least in, in the, the exposure film, you didn't really, you never really know what's going to happen out there, so what the story will be. And I didn't approach it as a, as a climate change film, per se. In fact, you know, obviously it was going down at climate change ground zero, so it was going to be um, part of the story, but, but in a way kind of off to the side, in a way like, you know how you can look at a star and if you look right at it, you can't see it, but if you look off to the side, you, well, you guys know that, right? You're all scientists. So like that's sort of how I think about this, the, the, the climate change in this story. I mean, everything's taking place, every open lead of water they have to cross, every sort of physical hazard, every, the fact, which I'll just throw out there, is that there hasn't been an expedition of this sort um, that's been able to go since since the one we documented because of not only the receding sea ice, but the um, geopolitical situation and uh, Russian airspace issues and, and the pandemic, of course. But um, anyway, so um, one of the characters is a scientist in the film. So she kind of uh, carries that thread of the story through. Um, so in, in the stuff I do, it's usually very personal, very intimate and um, and then certain characters kind of take on the voice from, of a certain theme that they're most passionate about. Oh, that's a great answer, Holly. I relate to that a lot. I think, you know, with filmmaking, the more personal that we can create these stories, the more personally people can connect to things that feel so foreign and remote. And, you know, something like ice shelves or these places in our polar regions, um, when we hear about the changes to that ice, it really it's easy for people to feel disconnected, but um, I think through the power of film and adventure and personal storytelling, we can really build a first-hand connection to these places. Sarah, as a scientist, have you worked with filmmakers on a project? Uh, and if you haven't, if you were as a scientist, how would you work with them in helping to shape the narrative so that the science happens over a long period of time, right? There's not that aha moment generally. So in creating a story that's important, um, how do you as a scientist help facilitate that? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a great question and it's, it's wonderful to hear these answers um, because you know, as a scientist, you're out there in the elements on the polar ice sheet with this sort of driven mission focus of getting the science project done. And often there are, um, whether it's filmmakers, uh, you know, radio stories, TV programs, um, worked with a wide variety of people like that. Um, they want to come and they want to capture sort of a moment in time and have that be the whole story. So the challenge is to try to weave together, you know, the few days or maybe weeks that that storyteller may be with you and they want a whole arc of a story to happen then. And you're trying to essentially fit decades into that because the scientific process is, you know, before you set foot in a place like Greenland, you know, maybe you spent 20, 10 years developing that project, getting funding, getting your team together, and you have this brief, intense time to get the science done, and then there may be another five to 10 years before really, you know, all of the results are out and you've been able to share them with the world. Um, so I think it's important to, to tell the human story, the adventure story, the kind of exploration, um, the vastness of these landscapes, the urgency of the change, um, but then I'd also like to try to find a way to tell that longer term story, you know, sort of why are we here? What, what came before this science project? You know, where are we gonna go with this information that we learn? I think there's a role to be played um, with the, the filmmaking there as well. Will, do you wanna talk a little bit about the, the, after the Antarctic expedition and the role that the filmmakers played who were there with you? Yep. Yeah, after Antarctica, um, Natasha and Sebastian, uh, first of all, produced the film and put everything together. We had, had 50 years of archives and a, a lot of you know, 180 hours of recordings of Antarctica uh, uh, through tape recording. Uh, they did that and then, then they traveled with me or, uh, at the end in the beginning of two of my solo expeditions. And then we spent a lot of time, four years together, 
up in Ely and holidays and so forth. So we, we spent a whole block of time over a four or five year period. But uh, half of the film is also based on uh, 36 hours of film that was taken by some uh, three French filmmakers that traveled with us. They came in four or five times throughout the expedition. And uh, these guys were all experienced climbers and sailors uh, and, and filmmakers. They were really tough individuals because they had to travel with us and, uh, and they lived in the same conditions as we lived in, up at quarter to six in the morning, you know, to quit at six at night. And although their quitting time was until about two in the morning, by the time they had to uh, take apart their cameras, take all the frost out, get ready for the next day. And uh, so they, they lived it. Uh, in the in the ranks, and uh, I've seen a lot of expedition footage just over the last 60 years, and uh, the 36 hours that they did is quite remarkable. They did uh, super uh, 16 millimeter film, so it was regular film, and then reel to reel with a boom mic. So the guy that did the sound, you know, carried this, you know, accordion size recorder, uh, which is incredible. It's on the on the film the. It, it's the sound that really brings everything alive. You can hear the dogs breathing from a quarter mile away and so forth. So that type of a filmmaking is extremely tough. Um, they also had to travel down from France through all the you know, rigmarole of getting into Antarctica, flying in, all the waiting. And then a couple of times they got stormed in with us and then coming back. So there's a combination, almost a lifestyle that they live. But, um, and I couldn't say they're, they weren't intrusive. I mean, they're the greatest guys in the world. Uh, and they had the same temper, temperament as we did, very patient in that. Uh, but when you're doing a film like that, uh, and you're on an expedition, it takes a lot of, also a lot of patience on your side, and particularly with the other team members. As, as a leader, I knew that you need the film, that's the way you get your message out. But uh, on the film, there's Jeff Summers, one of the guys from Britain, had a problem with the film when they came in. And so that, that deals a kind of a dyna dynamics that you also have to work in because uh, you can't travel your normal day. You've got to stop and then they have to set up and, you, and you're freezing your feet. You're doing everything you can. The dogs are you know, really getting ambunctious to go. And then you run another five minutes and you stop. So it's this type of, you know, when you're having a documentary a film of yourself, people think, wow, that's really cool. But the flip side of that, it takes a lot of patience. But, uh, but these filmmakers, uh, the French filmmakers were really exceptional individuals. They went on to do many other great things, you know, in the jungle and uh, higher elevations and so forth. So when we talk about, you know, science and storytelling, I mean, some people are like, oh, boring, you know. Um, but as storytellers, you guys know how exciting it is or how interesting or how nuanced it is. And do you feel a certain obligation or in the back of your mind, are you thinking about what you're doing in terms of connecting this story to the broader world when you're filming, um, even before you start editing? Do you film for the story or do you film for the film? Okay. Go on for that? Sure. <laughs> That's a good question, Judy. Um, I mean, I think it's, I think of, especially through the making of this film, of filmmaking like an expedition in and of itself, where you you have the vision and you set your eyes to a North Star, but in terms of the route, there's so many unknowns, and it's really um, being present in that process that helps the route develop as you go. And so I think, you know, for my process with this film or, you know, you know very science-driven films, it's really about um, getting to the heart of whose story we're amplifying. So there was so much great work with Will here on preliminary interviews and really building relationship and trust and, and getting to know what those core themes were. And once we realized the theme of international cooperation and bringing to life this journey um, to show the changes that have taken place since, um, there was also a lot of work in terms of how can we um, kind of that micro-macro balance of um, by a very personal story about Will also speak to more of these universal themes that we could all connect and relate to. Um, and then in terms of the science, just really um, keeping in tune to what are those messages we're hoping to convey and how to really work with Will, work with experts, and um, you know, making sure that everything is as accurate and um, factual as we can. 
so Sarah, uh, um, Kathy Kasich writes that she was written into the NSF grant, um, which is, I don't know if it's unusual, it seems like it might be, for a filmmaker and a storyteller to be funded by the Science Foundation, National Science Foundation. But do you want to talk about sort of what that means or how things, um, how that works for people who are lay people? Sure, yeah. So, um, you know, when scientists come together and formulate an idea for a project, say in the Antarctic or the Arctic, um, you know, generally we're, we're primarily or first driven by some important science question, motivating question, or a hypothesis we want to test or something like that. Um, but we need funding to go and do that work. And a lot of the funding for polar science comes from um, the National Science Foundation. So all of your tax dollars at work. So thank you all for supporting us in that. And for a long time now, um, NSF has recognized and many other agencies that it's not enough for us just to be proposing and doing science um, for its own sake. We need to have what they call um, broader impact. And so every single proposal, every project that's funded now through NSF has a broader impact component. And that can take many forms in terms of education, outreach, communication. Um, but you know, it always has to touch on something sort of bigger than your one specific question, which I think is so important. Um, and if you go now, even on the NSF website, you can look up any project and you can read about sort of these broader implications. But one way that that can be manifested is by writing in, for example, um, in the Salsa project, the lake under Antarctica, you know, directly in the planning stage, you know, they, they probably reached out to filmmakers or artists or um, writers and asked them to participate directly. And so you have that, you know, as part of your pitch, as part of your proposal. So that's a, that can be really successful. I've um, had a couple of examples where I've directly written, for example, teachers, um, science and high school teachers into my programs and have been able to take them on our expeditions and have that be an important component. There's also a program, um, they've just changed the name, but I believe it's now called Polar Steam through the National Science Foundation, which is a way to support artists, writers, um, all sorts of creative and um, storytelling people to travel to the Arctic and the Antarctic, uh, not necessarily aligned with a project. So you can just propose as an individual or a team to, for example, go down to Antarctica um, with an idea and the National Science Foundation will support you um, to do that, recognizing again that it's all bigger than just one science question. Holly, your, your film probably wasn't funded by the National Science Foundation. Do you want to talk about sort of how your film came together and who is the driving force behind it? Well, the uh, expedition was entirely the brainchild of Felicity Aston, who is a veteran South Pole. She was the first woman to cross Antarctica solo, I don't know, maybe a decade ago, something like that. Um, so this uh, expedition was entirely her idea. And she put out in 2016 a global call for applications to, for team members. And um, thousands of women applied to be on this team. And that's when I heard about the project. Um, and I um, tracked, tracked her progress. Um, and well, to be honest, I actually uh, applied and I got rejected. <laughs> but um, we'll leave that aside. Um, she was not, <laughs> I like to think she would, it was because she wasn't so interested in Americans. But anyway. Um, uh, so anyway, she put together this remarkable team, which I failed to mention earlier. The most remarkable team was not their, um, you know, extremely international scope, and that even that they were all women, but was that they were all regular people. Uh, they were not uh, athletes, much less polar-ready people. Um, so the the project takes place over the course of two years, where the team train meets and trains together in Iceland a couple of times, and then they train in the Middle East in Oman, and um, so it's a long arc um, to get to the North Pole. And I think we all know there's so much that happens besides our small amount of time in that region. Um, so that yeah, that's how it it, it came about, and. Um, I think one of the interesting through lines in all of these films is really sort of, it doesn't matter if you're an expert explorer or a new explorer, it's 
kind of the same experience. And Will, I mean, you've had this experience more than probably anyone in the world almost. And the relationship between being an explorer and wanting to do something, but then having the just tenacity and the temerity to finish it, because it is not an easy thing to do. Um, it's not an easy thing to make a film or do the science around the Arctic or Antarctic. What does it take to, to do this? Yeah, it, it's, um, it's difficult because um, you look at the adventure and the hardship as being hard, when actually that's the frosting on the cake. It's uh, raising the money, first of all, which is very always very difficult, and getting, getting that part together. But also, for me, it's uh, uh, doing a personal best. Uh, I do solos now, but they're very small. But for 30 years, I, I led uh, international teams, and, and these had a very significant uh, educational problem, project or a project around climate change that might be or transboundary pollution. So there was, there was always a message or the, the expedition was more of a, a means to get the message across. And, uh, and uh, it seems like, especially school age kids, but I think adults in general, uh, adventure, dogs, North Pole, South Pole, that draws a lot of curiosity. That's a great way of getting information on science, what's happening up there real time, uh, the history of what's happened, and where it relates now to where we're at. Uh, so it's, it's more than just the adventure, although the, the adventure of just doing it is another, another part of the challenge, because I, uh, I always try to find the, the most difficult route, something that's going to be nearly impossible, and, uh, and for sure, I never follow in anybody's footsteps. And you have to do a lot of research, which is uh, the fun part, you know, trying to figure out logistically how are you going to do that, who will be on your team, what countries do you need. Uh, the media, I mean, you can't, get, you can't get sponsorships without the media. It's a chicken or an egg. You know, no one, no one, if it's a major expedition, no one's going to sign up if, it's, if no one's following it. So you need the media, but then you also we, we built up a huge system of schools international around the country back in the 90s and the turn of the centuries that were involved in these expeditions. We did a lot of work uh, pre-internet and when the internet just started on board, you know, in 1999, uh, right around that time, it was, uh, uh, it was really a golden time in education of, of uh, exploring the internet for the first time and what that meant in school systems. So, but it was never easy. None, none of it was easy. And you always risk the, the chance of coming back with a million dollars worth of debt. Because once you get the ball rolling, uh, you, have to, you have to follow through with it. And uh, so you have to make it through. And if a recession comes during that two, three year period we were organizing it, you know, it can be really hard. You know, the economic times, the political times. Um, and right now, there's no traveling anymore in the North Pole for the politics now. And it's, it's like it was in the Cold War. The Cold War broke, you know, after 1990. That opened up the whole eastern side of the Antarctica, all of this area that was not available because of the Cold War at that time. So, so it's, it's a flux of a many different moving parts, but all with the goal of, of educating, bringing about awareness, bringing about policy shifts. Um, I'm a science educator, so it's really about modeling a lot of science uh, uh, STEM, which is where STEM is where all the real jobs are now these days. Getting women into science into STEM, you know, 15, 20 years ago, uh, it's all, all this was a, a grander vision that I always carried with me in education. And uh, uh, producing an educated electorate that can vote for the right people so we can get the right policies that favor the environment and the things that are very important to us to preserve this life on the planet and the world that we love so much. I know that I'm sure people have questions, um, so I think we'll open it up. Guest in the back. I'll repeat the question when somebody asks it. Who are you speaking to? Sorry. Pardon? Are you speaking to somebody or everybody? Okay. Everyone. Um, you have... Uh, you study the environment, obviously, which involves the ice, the water, the land, so on and so forth. 
And you also film the explorers who traverse that uh, as transient uh, occupants of that environment. And how much do you find that you also include those people who are most uh, highly affected and directly affected by those changes who are the indigenous peoples in those areas? So this question is about um, including indigenous peoples in the stories. That's a great question and a very important question. You know, for this specific film, this was really about Will's life and story, but with our impact, we're doing a lot around eyewitness storytelling because um, everyone is an eyewitness now, but especially um, really looking to indigenous voices in our Arctic communities. Um, so that's a big part of our impact, but also I think in, uh, you know, as storytellers in general, it's really um, for me about amplifying the voices of people of the communities that we're in. So those are stories that really need to be told and there's so much impact that is happening directly to people in these communities. Holly, did you? Uh, yeah, exposure is definitely um, more of a pure of an expedition film, not folk. Well, we were up on the Arctic sea ice, so it was um, there was nobody else around <laughs> except a few other explorers. Um, and, but I mean, I guess I think in terms of creating, you know, sort of products of intersectional environmentalism or, or, or whatever terminology you want to use. Um, I mean, I mean, I think in terms of exposure, I know people here haven't seen it, but if it has any impact, I think in, in, in the world of science and, and climate, it's, it's really around, um, and inspiring a next generation of, of climate leaders and particularly women and particularly young women who I think if we're going to get out of this mess are critical to that. Um, and, I, you know, the whole idea, if you can see it, if you, if you can be it, you know, all, the, some of these ideas I think um, are, are the takeaways from this film. I mean, I um, talk to a lot of, I, I would be really interested in hearing from teachers here, but teachers and educators, and they, they say the climate films that they have are just, and the young people are telling me this too, like they're just, you know, too depressing and they, they lock up, right? And they shut down and they're not actually making people feel like they have agency and, um, and empowered to make change. So in terms of exposure and some, the other work I do, if, if you can first reach your own potential, whatever that is, whether it's in science or climate specifically, or becoming an accountant, you know, and, and you're supported in that in the communities. Um, I mean, that to me, that's a big step in in, in making real change for the future. Or do you want to talk about that from the perspective of the projects that you work on? Sure. Yeah. So. Um, in the Arctic, where I work um, mostly out of uh, small towns in Greenland, um, you know, there's there's one component, which is the work that we're doing up on the glaciers, um, and it's sort of colloquially called there the inland ice. And um, sort of the vast Greenland ice sheet is, is fairly far removed from the daily life of most people that live in Greenland because the settlements are all focused on the coast. They're fishing. Um, traditional fishing and hunting communities. And um, it's been interesting talking to people who live locally about what the impact of melting of Greenland is or global warming. The Arctic is warming more than twice as fast as the rest of the planet, this sort of Arctic amplification. So the, the you know, the signal, the, um, the impact is, is much greater there. But in a place like Greenland, you know, it's not even all necessarily, we think of climate change as like always negative, but it's not even necessarily all negative. And so there's there's a lot of conversation around, um, uh, you know, sort of what does the impact mean? For example, you might lose the sea ice, so you might lose access to winter hunting grounds, but now maybe you can get your boats out in the winter when you couldn't before. Um, or, you know, it's very controversial, but, you know, where the glaciers have retreated in Greenland, maybe they're opening up more land that could be exploited for um, sort of mining and things like that. So it's it's quite nuanced. And I think it's important, you know, what it all gets back to is it is important to um, include everybody in the conversation, all points of view, and sort of keep an open mind, um, not sort of go into a place and assume that, you know, I'm here to study this and solve this for you because it's all bad. Um, there are a lot of real challenges that come with climate change. It's creating an entirely new world, especially in the Arctic. And that overall is going to 
have um, negative and strong consequences, but it's much more nuanced than that. question about indigenous peoples earlier um, and I was wondering if you um, met or got any advice from indigenous peoples on your ex expeditions and this question's for Will. Did you hear that? Well the question is did you meet with or get any advice from indigenous people on, before you went on your expedition? Yes uh, actually we traveled with the you Inuit know, hunters uh, 07 08 uh, back then we wanted to put a cultural face on climate change because people were confused by the climate, but like the story. And um, so traveling with the Inuit hunters, um, we were able to, you know, that story was very important. Uh, the Inuit, um, you know, for, of course, their life, the ice is melting, everything's changing in the culture up there right now. In addition to the cultural changes, the internet, everything else that's going on. Uh, so in order to maintain the traditional values and balance that with uh, modern value, values is very, very difficult. But uh, they were very fortunate. Uh, Nunavut was able to get basically their own, like or their own providence or their own, own old uh, government uh, uh, about 20 years ago, which really, really made a big difference up there. But uh, in terms of the, the Inuit culture and how what we we've learned from that, individuals in that. Uh, of course, we, we use the Inuit dogs, the dogs, the mukluks, the way that they travel. Uh, a lot of that is really pertinent. Um, and then a lot of things have changed, like the old traditional knowledge was based on a certain wind direction. Now that prevailing wind direction is changing. So there, there is kind of a, it's, it's two sides of the coin uh, up there. But uh, the good news on the Inuit culture is they're maintaining their, their culture, their language, because in the 70s, it looked like it, the whole culture was gonna go off the rails. They were losing their language. They didn't have dog teams anymore. Now they have their own government. Now they have their, their language. Uh, most of their people stay in the villages or in the north. Uh, that's the good news. But, uh, and we did a lot of interviewing with the elders. The elders had a lot of, I mean, the traditional knowledge is very important. But their approach, the elders' approach, was that, uh, was that of adaption. First of all, they would, most, almost all the elders would say that they can't change anything that's not within their power. And they're not going to worry about something they can't change. But if the sea level rises, we'll just move our village up. If the ice melts, they'll fish more than hunting, I mean, it's kind of a simplistic way of, of doing, uh, talking about it, but they looked at it more of adapting around, surviving still, but adapting. Whereas we in our modern era, uh, it's very hard for us to adapt and survive because we're so, we're so stuck on this polluting way. I mean, the garbage that we all created here when we ate out in the restaurants. I mean, it just goes on and on. Uh, we're stuck in this culture of waste, and uh, it's our culture. And uh, how do we change that? The climate change, by the way, affects people of color you know, incredibly more than white privilege like we have here. Uh, I mean, they're stuck in the lower areas with the poorer jobs. So uh, climate change doesn't affect people at the same pace. I mean, here we're able to you know, buy our way out of it, literally. Whereas, but it, you know, it's, it's really a social justice. We're, we're at a real crisis and a crux right now. It's not just climate. I mean, there's, uh, to me, there's two, two major issues right now, race and climate. And they really come together at a central point. And this includes the native people, but it also includes all people of color that haven't prospered so well in our culture. And I'm not, I'm not sure they're, they're uh, to see the see, you know, white supremacy is hard to think for white people and that, but you know, you can go only so far in guilting and shaming, but you have to really, first of all, see the connection of our advantages. You, uh, you know, to neg get negative, negative on yourself about it and all that, kind of are guilty, that, that's anti-productive. But uh, you first have to see the issue before you do anything about it. And, and I feel 
we're moving in the right direction. And the changes that we've seen, I mean, we had the murder of Floyd in Minneapolis, and right where our office is, you know, half a mile from there. All my staff lives in that area. And, but that, that went around the world, and uh, that's two years ago. And, uh, but, you know, we really have to keep our eye on the mark and race and, and, and the inequities. Uh, I approached climate, though, 20 years ago because I saw really clearly that the way out of the climate was the revolution of a new economy, not just clean energy, but the whole economy now, the way we're going to be building and running everything, cost-efficient, you know, energy efficient. And I saw 20 years ago, because without creating good jobs for people, we only can go f so far with programs. We need economy. We need good jobs for everybody. And I saw that, that was my, that's why I stuck with climate. Because if it wasn't for the economy, uh, and I worked very hard and everybody, uh, a lot of people worked very hard on the policy to get our, our solar standards, the, the standards that we have with so much electricity at a certain year that jump started this new economy. So now anyone that has uh, that's has technology, has training in technology, and I work a lot in construction in that in inner city, any type of skill like that, there's really great jobs. So moving in that direction, there's uh, we're looking at the end of the world in a way, but we're looking at some of the greatest opportunities we've ever had in science, technology, employing our people. But uh, we really have to get our eye on the mark. You know, what I've learned really in, in expeditions and why I survived is that, um, you know, you can't doubt on an expedition. If I doubt or a team ever doubts, it's all over with. You know, if we're being negative and it's the end of the world and we're lost on this thing, uh, we don't go anywhere. Uh, and us as individuals, we do have a lot of influence, you know, not only by what we purchase, but by all of our associations. But you really need one person alone is not going to do it. But by joining other people or other groups or whatever it is that's in your own sphere of influence uh, to get a grip on this. We can't put our heads in, in the sand. Um, that's, I don't want to get too far in that, but, you know, climate's a tough tough issue, you know, and it's, and, and it's not an equity, it's not an equitable situation here that we're looking at. It's very inequitable. Uh, Hi. Um, so I'm curious if any of you could speak to how uh, geopolitical current affairs have shaped communication and research around climate change. So. Earlier you mentioned Russian airspace is no longer accessible, but for instance, uh, the other day when I watched the lake at the bottom of the world, and unfortunately the filmmaker isn't here today, I noticed that there was a US military presence um, in terms of the vehicles, that, like the airplanes that were being used to transport the scientists, and I also noticed that most of the scientists were American. And so I was just curious if that influences the way that you have seen climate change communicated and also the kind of research that's being done and how funding is found. I can touch on some of that. So um, as a US-based scientist working in the polls, we actually have a strong partnership with um, the military. It's how we access the um, Antarctic Research Stations. It's a National Science Foundation has an agreement with the um, it's primarily with the Air Force and, and Navy because we use their transport planes and they're really the only um, planes that are able to get our equipment and our people out onto the ice. Um, and similarly in Greenland, there's um, sort of, I think, a legacy of the Cold War. There's still a, a US military presence in Greenland. And so there is um, active transport all year round of researchers um, using the Air National Guard. Um, it's, it's not a military, to rise, <laughs> I don't know if that's the right word. Um, you know, it's, I would say, a partnership um, from the scientist's perspective. I can't speak to what's going on um, when the scientists aren't around. Um, it, you know, but research in both places is really very international. So that film um, about the Lake of the Bottom World Salsa was, you know, was focused on a US research camp. And so I think most of the scientists there were funded by a US program 
um, and they would have you know, been represented in the film that way. But science in Antarctica more broadly is extremely international. Many, many nations have research stations around the continent. And there are many um, projects that are very international in scope, um, more so than that one that was featured. And similarly in Greenland, you have um, countries from all over the world that are doing research there. I think there is um, room and opportunity for there to be even more international collaboration within specific projects, but just because of how science is funded and supported, um, especially in the US primarily through um, sort of government grants, it can be a challenge to get all those nations and grants aligned the same way, but there's definitely an effort underway to um, always increase that international participation. And part of that too is, is, you know, when filmmakers make a film, they're telling a story at a point in time. And so it may not be the only thing that is happening there. Yes, right there. This is a question for Will. Because I heard last night that when you wished to go to the Antarctic, it was the United States and the National Science Foundation that was discouraging your effort to do so. And yet you put together a team of representatives from most of the, or many of the important nations who built the understanding, which is the Antarctic Treaty. As we go forward facing this crisis of the global warming and so forth, what do you see as the hope for those nations working together again, as opposed to defending little boundaries and territories and, and the kind of disagreement that is threatening the earth right now? Yeah, well, the uh, NSF thing was just uh, part of the policy back then 30 years ago, which uh, has changed since then. Um, but uh, Antarctica, the treaty, and especially science down there, like we mentioned, very international. In fact, it was formed, uh, the, the, the um, Antarctic Treaty was formed during the International Geophysical Year, which was an uh, 18-month study in 1957 uh, and 58, during the Cold War, when all the missiles were pointed at each other. And, uh, and at that time, they didn't even know the source of the Northern Lights. So, and that was launched uh, October 1st, and four days after that, they launched the first satellite with Russia that whole space age developed around that era. But here we had the worst uh, military disaster that we were looking at. But all the, all the countries around the world, Russia, United States, all cooperated. Uh, uh, and they centered around Antarctica, but they studied the atmosphere all around the globe. But uh, out of that was the Antarctic Treaty that set Antarctica aside for science only, no military, no nuclear, open inspection, and so forth, open bases. Uh, so uh, it's been a remarkable example, I think the best example we've ever had of international cooperation. And that's where science comes in. I mean, uh, a lot of the, it's in the polar regions, you rarely see just one country doing silent science on their own. So I always, a, uh, I know in Canada, uh, we were up together doing filming in Cambridge Bay. They have a huge science uh, base up there now that scientists from all around the world now are coming up to study the permafrost and the, uh, the issues in that particular area. So I think science is uh, the, the best way of, always has been, of cooperation. Uh, where you kind of lay down the politics and your viewpoints and you're all, you're all together because you always, you're all doing your same science and that, that, that type of a commitment. Yes, back there. Yep. Oh, I was surprised by everything all the time. <laughs> not, um, I mean, I've done a lot of expedition kind of stuff, but nothing that extreme and only one Arctic, a uh, milder Arctic expedition. Um, so, I mean, I guess what, you know, a huge takeaway for me and I would say surprising is um, what 
these very regular women were capable of. We, wa we walked into this situation documenting them and they were a team that was uh, uh, counted out. And there was even a lot of resistance from the um, you know, polar community there, like, like this team had no business being out there. Um, maybe, maybe not, but they did it and they, um, I won't say whether or not they prevailed, but um, so I guess, I, and I was one of those people was like, wow, do we, you know, silently, as, as Will said, you can't really admit it if you're, if you're going down the rabbit hole of negativism out there. But, um, but, but everybody had incredible mental fortitude, and even though they were not physically, uh, uh, you know, trained athletes, and there were ages 22 to 50, um, what they were capable of when they came together, when they had one another's back, when they had a few bits of luck, and um, uh, so that that was a, I mean, it was a remarkable moment in the special alchemy that can happen when you do have a well operating team that you can come over uh, overcome so much. That that's a great answer, and actually, I would say very similarly. Even as a scientist, um, one of the biggest surprises for me over my career has been how so much of the success of the science that we do, the field work and expeditions, comes down to the teamwork, the um, the people involved, the adaptability, um, just you know, the energy and what you bring to it. Um, you can go as prepared as you want to do a science experiment in Greenland. You can have all of your tools and all of your backups and all of your flights planned and everything. And, and inevitably, you know, nev nothing's going to go exactly as planned. And it's really your ability to adapt and to still find success in the, sort of the hand that you're dealt. And really, that all comes down to the team of people that you have around you. Um, being able to build on everybody's strengths and work together. Communication is so important. Um, and it's it's ironic for me, I think I first got into uh, studying natural science um, because I thought maybe I could get away from all of the confusion I had as a child about people and how they interact. <laughs> it was never something that came naturally to understand group dynamics and interpersonal relationships and things like that. Um, and I was like, well, if I study the natural world, I don't have to worry about all these people. Um, <laughs> but you know, lo and behold, here decades later, really, um, it come back comes back around that even the purest science depends on the people and their relationships, and that's just always important. Yeah, for sure. For, uh, it's uh, myself. It's the power of cooperation, teamwork. Uh, it's, it's amazing what the human spirit can do, especially when you have a team. What, what you can achieve regardless of your situation, uh, just to have that spirit of, of cooperation and support and, and having the guts to do things that people say are impossible. It doesn't have to be first to the pole, but take your expedition to, from Borneo. Uh, everybody's counting you out because you're, you don't fit the whatever you're supposed to be look like when you're trying something. You know, failure is not trying. You know, whenever you try something, you're, you're, you're not failing. And, uh, and uh, when you try, and especially you try with a group, and you're working together on something, it's a remarkable uh, inspiration, a remarkable experience. And uh, I think that's true across the board. Yeah, those are all great answers. I think that theme of adaptation and cooperation was key to me too when I look at Will's story. And there was countless surprises each step of the way, but. Um, I, I was able to learn so much just through being able to look and learn more about Will's lens. But, um, you know, I think that theme of international cooperation was something that really stuck out to me early in getting to know Will's story. The fact that against all these odds, they brought together this incredible team and were able to achieve so much um, with the treaty at the end as well. So there's so much power when we, you know, use our voices to come together. And on. That note, okay. We'll, we'll have one more very quick question right there. Hi, yes, uh, as a uh, science educator and also facing some climate deniers, I would like each of the panelists to just recommend um, a film or something that could bring more education to people who deny that this is happening. After Antarctica, <laughs> the lake at the bottom of the world and exposure. I mean, seriously, let's go ahead. 
Ditto. And I would say, um, I think the conversation in, cl in climate filmmaking, I mean, I think it's, it's evolving or it needs to evolve. And um, so maybe tonight or uh, off stage here, we can talk about what that looks like, what you need. I mean, I don't, I think, I don't know you, if you're dealing with climate deniers, that's another story, but it does feel like the conversation has moved beyond that, that there's uh, uh, Jeff, uh, Orlowski, who made Chasing Coral and Chasing Ice, said recently at a, something I saw him at, he's like, I, I would never make that film now. At the time, he had to make a particular film because that was the conversation in the climate uh, world in terms of this is actually happening. I think we're somewhere else now. How do we, how do we create agency and action coming out off the films? At least that's something I'm interested in. Yeah, it's a challenge. I don't have a specific film or you know set of resources at my fingertips to recommend. But I think what's important is that everybody has to find their own way to understanding change. And so, if someone is really coming at the question, you know, with really dug in their mind that you know they're in denial or that you know a lot of this is is sort of based on people's belief system, and it's very hard to change that. So, what may be more successful is for that person to just find a different entry, right? What do we ultimately hope is the outcome? I, I would hope that we'd figure out how to create a better world, a better future. And I hope we can all come together and agree that that's what we would see as success. And so for some people, that's gonna look different. It may say maybe we need you know, a different kind of economic system that's gonna um, be better for me and my children. Maybe for others, it will be environmental cleanup. Maybe for some others, you know, it will be that they wanna play a hand in, you know, um, uh, furthering scientific causes by you know, things like uh, citizen science or making their own observations. There's a role for everybody. So I really, meeting people where they're at would be my best suggestion. And our film and science initiative was started really, you know, as a way to bring together filmmakers and scientists to tell what we say are better stories about science. And better is a very open word, uh, purposefully so. And you know, we hope that over time, our role is both be a curator of films that are out there, and so you can look at our website and our content for that, but also to bring together people to have conversations and then to facilitate making films so that um, stories can be told. So on that note, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Thank you to our panelists.